Okay, so I, I really want to th walk through uh, some of the exploration uh, steps that uh, one needs to take and, and one needs to think about uh, as a young geologist. For those who want to get into the exploration field, particularly for, for diamonds, and I think John Bristow made the comment quite uh, often that uh, we do need new blood and new ideas in this, uh, in this business. So um, let, me, let me take you through some of the, the thoughts and ideas on, on exploration and how we should go about it in the future. Um, before doing that, it's, it's important to look at a bit of the history of, um, of the, the uh, production and, and the uh, production profile of diamonds globally uh, over time. Uh, and it's all driven by, by exploration uh, discoveries. Uh, we see various kimberlites starting in the 1960s um, in, in Russia, uh, Iraq in the 70s, Xuanheng, and all these discoveries added to um, an enormous increase in production of, of uh, natural diamonds um, for consumption uh, on, in the market. But I guess the peak uh, reached in, the ninth, in, in about 2005, sitting around 170 million uh, carats per annum, uh, reduced um, firstly because we went through some financial uh, crises globally, but, but also because um, many of these discoveries were reaching the end of their, their life. And um, uh, as, as was mentioned uh, early on, uh, we see Argal, a, a big producer of carrots, uh, closing recently. So the trend is really down, down um, from the 170 million carrots per annum. So um, it is time that we make uh, a look at uh, new discoveries. And, um, and that's really what we need to think about for, for the future. Uh, I just put down here a couple of books actually that, that always interested myself. Uh, uh, and Baron Lands was already spoken about um, uh, early on in the week uh, with the discovery of the Kimberlites and the diamonds in Canada. Um, and Bar the Diamond Seeker tells you about John Williamson's discovery in Tanzania, a very interesting read. Uh, we put together recently uh, a book on prospecting in Africa by uh, De Beers geologists and how they lived and how they uh, worked through their programs. Uh, and another interesting book is, is, is uh, Robert Friedland's story on, on uh, his various discovery, but particularly this one on Vosey Bay. But the trend of all these books is really the, the fact that the, the discoverers of all these uh, various uh, deposits were people that ha had incredible enthusiasm and, and uh, interest in, in exploration. And uh, if you don't have that from the start, um, I don't think this is a, is a game that you want to get in, involved with. You have to have that interest and that tenacity to uh, to enjoy and, and, and find that uh, the challenge is um, exciting. So just to, um, just to go back to the discovery uh, issue, and um, uh, we see that the 2005 high that we had at about 170, 175 million carats. Um, the only sort of light in the tunnel at the moment is the discovery in, in Angola, which Herman uh, Gruter spoke about yesterday. But other than that, the trend is still very much in a downward uh, in a downward way, but it, it's not just for for diamonds. It's we see this trend in many other uh, commodities, gold and copper and so on. Um, there ha there has to be a new take in to, in exploration to try and find new new deposits. In terms of uh, the exploration for for kimberlites, and I've put it two slides here, uh, two graphs showing the number of diamond bearing kimberlites found per decade and, and a definition of a diamond bearing kimberlite is anything over a carat a ton. Um, and it just shows you how steady it was up to the 1950s when uh, the Russian discoveries came on onto the scene and then Botswana and then Argal and Canada. But since sort of 2000, there's been a really downward trend of this, uh, of the discovery of the number of kim kimberlites with diamonds being discovered. Uh, and one can do the same thing by uh, adding all the totals of the hectares of the surfaces of those kimberlites. And we're really running out of uh, new uh, discoveries to come onto the, onto the market. There are other reasons why, uh, why we see this decline. It's, it's also many of the mines are, are getting older. Uh, they have to go underground. 
and going underground uh, is a is a major shift in uh, in the amount of material that one can extract uh, in comparison to an open pit mine. So uh, it becomes costlier, becomes more uh, difficult to get out the tonnages that one requires, <clears throat> and eventually um, the the econo the economics drive the closure of such mines. It's interesting if you look at Kimberley; the, those mines were started in the 1870s. Um, five major mines at the time. Three of those Kimberlites are still mined today at, re at quite considerable depth, um, but it's it certainly has reduced uh, the tonnages that are coming out of those uh, bodies. Uh, in addition to the Kimberlites, we see uh, a, a, re a re major reduction in, um, in alluvial diamonds being produced. We had the Marangi deposits in, uh, in Zimbabwe that were running at 10 to 50 million cares per annum over a fairly short period of time. That's reduced uh, significantly and uh, the, the, uh, the, the estimates are that it's sitting around uh, 1 million cares per annum at the moment. The Macquarie has closed down. Uh, we, see we see the reduction of the uh, onshore Namibian uh, deposits. So overall, really see a major reduction in, in uh, diamonds coming on the, onto the scene. Uh, and, and this was mentioned yesterday as well, the, the majors and, and the juniors, who's doing the work, who is putting the, the risk money up front. And it's becoming more and more the juniors who are um, putting up uh, a lot of the, the risk money in the hope of, of attracting majors in, uh, in further development of new projects. So uh, we, I'm not going to go into de detail on this. We spoke about this yesterday, but it really is quite interesting to see that the supply and demand is, is very much out of phase uh, and will continue to be so um, if, um, if we don't find something new on the, on the, uh, on the horizon. So if you look at the, the uh, exploration pipeline, it's, it's made up of various stages, um, starting with target selection, going into some regional sampling, some follow-up sampling, geophysics, uh, which was discussed in detail yesterday, drilling, evaluation, and then into mining. Um, the risks at this early stage are high, but the costs are generally low. So it's a, it's a stage where uh, one can um, put some money up front, uh, try and develop some new targets, and see if this can uh, move into a, a project that uh, has more potential, but also then becomes more expensive to develop um, using um, more uh, sophisticated technology to uh, move it along. A typical sort of uh, flow chart of uh, exploration, which, um, which is based really on Margaret Muggeridge's uh, uh, work, is to start with target selection. Uh, where do you, where would you put your money uh, to try and locate a, uh, a deposit that's worthwhile um, exploring? And these are there are various uh, issues that one has to think about: the the, the, the presence of cratons, the, so the geochronology. You need to look at. Um, you need to look at. Are there, is there any uh, regional geophysics available? Is, what's the geology like? Are there cover areas of younger? sediments than uh, Kimberlites that you may expect. Uh, what is the structure like? Are there structural uh, traps that may uh, host um, Kimberlites to come through? And then the, one has to think very carefully about the geomorphology and, and uh, the re rheology. The, what, are the, what are the soils like? What is the drainage like? How do I uh, uh, develop a program that would cover these things? Um, and in most cases, it is really worthwhile to do a fields visit once you've identified an area of interest. You want to know what is the access, what are the logistics like, um, and, and what is the drainage development, what are the trap sites like. So these are things that one, that one needs to, to uh, sort out before you start deciding what sort of sampling uh, one is going to do, what size samples you're going to take. What are the, the sample intervals? What are your screen sizes that you need to think about? So those are important considerations, which then link also, how am I gonna treat these samples? How am I gonna concentrate them? Is it in an area which is difficult to get in and out of? Um, so that, those are aspects that really have to be mapped out before you actually start doing any work. You then would get into your, uh, once decided 
how are you going to tackle the area? You get into your regional sampling, it's either stream sampling, low sampling, or even till sampling, as in, in Canada. Um, you would then move into detailed sampling. You would think, look at some minerals that you may find, look at surface textures and mineral chemistries. Um, you then may decide to start looking at uh, airborne surveys to uh, hone in on two particular areas that may have had some interesting surface uh, results from surface sampling, um, and, and then go into ground geophysics and drilling. So that's a, it's a fairly uh, uh, st a very standard way of, of looking at an area, but there are no such things as shortcuts. There is no such thing as going from detailed sampling into drilling, because that ends up in, in tiers, uh, you're missing targets, um, missing drill targets, and perhaps walking away from areas that have not been properly investigated. So um, be careful how you, how you move from one stage to the next stage. Be careful that you don't take shortcuts because that really ends up in, in, uh, in problems. In terms of the target selection, and, and um, we've already spoken about uh, Clifford's rule in, 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 the 1966, in the 1960s, it was the first one to identify the relationship between diamond bearing kimberlites and, and kratons. It's a fairly well established um, fact now, um, although there are um, there are some uh, exam um, there are areas where perhaps this doesn't work too well, but in generally that is the way to look at new areas. Um, one can think of are there any diamonds in the areas? Do we have any uh, ideas on what type of diamonds these are, and, and maybe even some diamond ages? Uh, that that's all all very useful information um, when you do your target selection. What's the level of erosion? Uh, what's your cover? What's your soils like? Uh, are they likely to give problems when you do sampling? Um, and are there any major structural discontinuities? Do we have any idea on known kimberlites in the area that, that, that have perhaps some ages? Uh, and then what type of kimberlites have we got? Is it group ones or group twos that may have different um, mineral uh, that, that they produce? So at very aspect, a, a lot of these things can be done um, on, on a desktop and, and, and one can already done, do quite a lot of this um, selection of areas uh, from available information that is on, uh, on the internet or in books and papers. And it's worth spending quite a bit of time to get your target selection uh, fairly on a solid basis. So what do we look for? Uh, when we go out sampling, these are the sort of minerals that are, um, that are uh, part of our um, strategy in, in terms of, of uh, looking for kimberlites. Um, unfortunately, they, they never look as fresh and, and, uh, and sharp as they are in this picture. But these are the minerals that, uh, that um, are our pathfinders. It's the, the garnets in red, this, the chrono upsides in green, the um, ilmenites and spinels in black. And then obviously there are occasionally you would find a, a diamond in your samples. Now, I was speaking about uh, group one and group two kimberlites. Um, I think uh, Johan Stephen have a, has spoken a bit about kimberlites, but they tend to give you different uh, uh, indicator minerals, particularly with group twos where there is a lack of ilmenite, uh, uh, which is often a mineral which is extremely useful in tropical Africa uh, where Garnets tend to uh, be subjected to uh, to weathering, and the ilmenites are ones that are often uh, uh, survive uh, these uh, these weathering uh, processes. Um, so let's just have a look at heavy mineral sampling, and I've put in a couple of, of lessons here. Um, you either may be working for a for a, a junior company that's listed or you may even be working for a major company, but it's very important to start recording exactly uh, how you take doing your sampling and uh, what size intervals you're using and for what reasons. Um, and it's good to have a look at the SAMREC codes in South Africa and, and the York codes, or perhaps in Australia, if you're working there, to start getting a feel for the sort of things that you need to be aware of in terms of uh, record keeping. Very important one. So what is the objective is in heavy mineral sampling is to try and recover kimberlitic minerals uh, in order to establish areas that may be positive or areas that, uh, that may be negative. It, it, at this stage, it's not 
uh, the objective is not really to find individual kimberlites because that's not really what reconnaissance sampling is about. You can do alluvial sampling, uh, stream sampling, loam sampling, or till sampling. I mentioned that before. Uh, you need to think of the, are you going to take uh, uh, volume samples? Or are you going to take weight samples? But whatever you decide to do, be consistent about it. Um, think about the cover and, uh, in terms of thickness and type. And what is practical uh, in, in, in the area you're working? Uh, it's not uh, very easy to take a jig into the field. Um, you may want to really um, balance off the way that you sample against the practical accessibility of certain areas. Um, and then, of course, it's um, the interval of samples. That that's, um, ties in with the cost against time. How quickly can one sample? You can sample an area on a very wide grid but then you're likely not to, to find what you're looking for. So you, you need to think very carefully on, the, on your intervals, how you, um, how you space your samples. And people tend to be much conservative, so they probably take uh, slightly more samples than, than uh, necessary, but that's probably better than, uh, than undersampling an area. And then you need to decide, are you looking at very fine grain uh, sediments? Are you looking at coarse sediments? What are, the, what are your mesh sizes that you're going to use in your screens? All things that, that's, that sound very simple, but that make a huge difference in terms of your discovery uh, um, uh, chances. Now, I, I, I just want to point out a very simple thing. Make sure that you label your samples properly and clearly and, and store your concentrates as long as you can. It's always good to go back to your concentrates. The, the sorters may have missed something. An example I always like to use is the discovery of the, the Kasai diamonds. The Kasai diamonds is in, in sudden um, DRC. It's a mass of um, alluvial deposits, which was uh, found in 1909, but the, the license was given to a company called Fori Minier, and they sampled it between two, 1907 and 1909 and found nothing. And uh, <clears throat> they were running out of money, so they decided to go back to their concentrates, which they had stored in Brussels in their laboratory. And right enough, they found a, a diamond in one of the samples. However, as luck may be, that sample didn't have a number. It didn't have a, anything written on the bottle. So now they had to compare these, these samples, this sample with other samples that had numbers and where the concentrate looked fairly similar. And eventually after three extra missions, they they did find um, the, uh, the sample site, more or less, and uh, found more diamonds and, and, and eventually found this, uh, this deposit. But they wasted quite a lot of time and effort by not having the right, uh, having a number on your samples. So in my view, any sample without a number, you may as well throw in a dustbin. Okay, so we, uh, we will talk a little bit about sample collection, sample treatment, the sorting, and then the, uh, the, uh, the grain analysis, which I will, won't go into in too much of a detail. Sample collection, and, and uh, this is a, a work that was um, highlighted by um, Maureen Muggeridge, who was uh, instrumental in finding uh, our gall deposit in Australia. She sort of looked at the various areas and then look at, tied in what type of soil, what type of sampling one would need to do in order to, uh, to cover these areas. And it's, it's just interesting to read her, her, her paper and her, her logic. Um, if you have uh, a mountainous areas with good drainage, so stream sampling would be the one to go for. It's uh, quick and easy, uh, and um, it's uh, very representative of, uh, of the area. Flat areas with no drainage would require soil sampling and so on. Areas with a lot of overburden, you may want to think about airborne geophysics, but that could be become very expensive. So these are geomorphological uh, constraints that one needs to consider. You also need to look at um, the indicator minerals. Um, that um, this is a, 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 a histogram of some results from tillite sampling, um, where most of the indicators are found in the finer sizes. And we see that the same in loam sampling. And this is not only a reflection of the uh, concentration of indicated minerals in, in kimberlites, where the dominance is in the finer fraction, but also in a larger 
grains break down in the uh, in the weathering profile. So the farther you go, the more uh, indicators one is likely to find. But of course, that comes at a cost because finer grain samples are very much more difficult to uh, to sort and to handle. Um, some basic guidelines, uh, which which I just want to re-emphasize again, Reconnaissance work is not to find um, individual kimberlites. We're looking for clusters. We know that all kimberlites occur in clusters. So um, the reconnaissance work, the interval of sampling should be defined those clusters. And an interesting comment always is that economic clusters were all found by sampling. You go look at all these um, diamond um, regions, all those were found by sampling. So target selection is critical. And you know, as I said before, have a look if there are diamonds around. We see that at, at some of these other uh, areas where one where these big mines were found, Cullinan, uh, Kimberley, the Moroa. Um, these were all places where diamonds occurred in the area. But be systematic. Make make sure that all the samples are are labeled, and be consistent. Either sampling with volume or weight, uh, the way you, you take your sample, if you, if you decide to do it one way, then do all the samples the same way and try and keep it simple. These are just some basic guidelines. Um, it's, this is a, a graph of a, uh, some orientation sampling that I did in the, in the Kalahari. We were sampling for uh, some, some areas that contained very fine grained Kalahari sand. And this is a a, uh, uh, a cumulative graph of showing you the size ranges of this sand, which is sitting mainly in the 0.3 to 0.4 size fraction. So here we have to make sure that we uh, um, that we um, link our size range of our screens to uh, the size of material that we're going to sample. Very important. Then um, the, how are we going to take our samples? Are we going to take our samples using uh, a spade or a, um, a brush, which can either be done, but if you decide on one, then stick to stick to that for the for the same program. You remember that we are trying to do reconnaissance sampling, and we therefore sampling the deflation surface of the soil horizons. Those have the highest put, uh, potential or the highest chance of finding indicator minerals, heavy minerals. Is this deflation surface? So by brushing, we brushing off the deflation material, or by spading, we just try and keep it as a very shallow dig in the soil. There's an example of, uh, of spading. There's a, a, about a, a square meter of, of uh, material that's taken off, and you can see how shallow that material is. Again, focusing on the deflation surface. So be consistent. There are some other um, sampling methods, and, and I'll talk a little bit about scoop sampling tomorrow in Botswana, um, where they use the clinometers on a bicycle wheel to measure distance. These days, that's uh, done uh, a, lit a little more easier uh, using a GPS. Um, but th that was one way of sampling. They decided to uh, scoop sample and use a, uh, a soil splitter in order to get a representative sample. And they would take a, a scoop every uh, 600 uh, or point half, half, a, half a mile um, and scoop, so regard that as one sample. Uh, that, is, that is fine, um, but, uh, but be consistent on that one. And, and make sure that each sample has a location. That's, that's, I've seen quite often that samples come in with numbers, but then the, the location wasn't recorded. Again, these may sound simple things, but those are extremely important to do it properly. Uh, stream sampling in the DRC. Uh, it's often quite useful to walk a stream up and down a bit and to identify a, uh, a good trap site. This, this trap site here, where there was a dolerite die cutting through, you can't actually see it, there's a, the top of it, uh, but an excellent site for, for trap sighting. So, um, do a bit of homework on on uh, on on your um, trap line selection and be be a bit more flexible in terms of where you're going to take a sample. Very important if you want to pick them up. 
the importance of trap sites again uh, was uh, is highlighted by uh, Maureen Muggeridge, um, and it makes perfect sense that uh, most of your good trap sites are sitting in your coarse gravels, while your poor trap sites, in this case, your is is very sandy. So these are things to look for. Look, have a look for percentage boulders. Look for any obstructions in the flow um, that you may find in a stream to uh, optimize the chances of finding your indicator minerals. And then, of course, logistics plays a role. These were programs that, uh, that we did in the DRC, and that, that hasn't really changed a lot. Um, you needed pirogues to get across rivers. You needed uh, bicycles or motorbikes to get through the forest. So there's only so much that you can carry for a two or three week trip. Um, there's only, only so much rice that you can take <laughs> to eat for two weeks. Um, but so do an orientation sample of, of the area that, that needs to be visited and, and also have a look at the seasonality. There may be the rainy season is not a good time to be in the forest. It's uh, swampy, difficult to get around. So choose your seasons if you, uh, if you decide to go into these sort of areas. This also leads to the fact that you can't take back big samples on, on the back of your motorbike. So you have to concentrate your, your samples and that can be done fairly easy um, using hand gravitation um, and uh, can be done very effectively. Here are the guys hand gravitating uh, screen samples. Um, they turn the screen over on top of a piece of uh, plastic bag and you can see the concentrate that, uh, that concentrated accumulated at the bottom of that screen in the center. That's uh, this guy. Uh, shows you how good a, a gravitator he is. He can concentrate that material. You may want to uh, reconcentrate that two or three times to make sure that you've got most of your indicator minerals. But um, you scoop that out with, uh, with, a, with a spoon, put that in a bag, and that's what you take back. So you don't have to take your whole sample back. You screen it, hand gravitate it, and take back the concentrate. Um, so sample concentration. Um, this is a photograph of the early concentration in Botswana where they used gold pans um, and uh, there was no screening involved at the time. Uh, and it showed that um, that th that wasn't a very effective way of doing it, particularly having a lot of fines in your gold pan. Um, so people went back to, um, to uh, um, screen samples and, uh, and using uh, hand gravitation as a medium to uh, our uh, jigs to uh, concentrate those screen uh, samples and produce a concentrate. Again, I, I've showed you that with hand gravitation, very easy to do. And then you, you take out your concentrate by, uh, by spoon and you collect that as your sample that goes to the laboratory. Uh, there are various jigs that are available. This is a garage jig uh, that would, would, was used on the West Coast quite a lot. It's a single-handed jig with a, for, for small samples. Um, but there are uh, other types of jigs. This is called a Zambian jig. And this is very good for uh, fine grain samples up to 0.3 of a millimeter, where the guy gently taps this rod here and moves this, um, this screen, which is sitting on a in a, in a cradle, moves it slightly up and down, and, and this the gentle force of that uh, tapping of the jig concentrates those uh, 0.3 samples, 0.3 millimeter samples uh, in the screen. Um, this, th this method was further um, mechanized by, P by uh, the Maid Tory, by Fenter and, and Gavin Armstrong. They produced what we call the um, the uh, Fenter jig, uh, and, and uh, it's a, a, a screen that goes up and down in these columns. And at the same time, there is an arm that turns them sideways. So you have a sideways movement and an up and down movement, and you can do four samples at a time. Uh, and it produces a, a very nice concentrate. However, you need to make sure that the jig is set up properly. It has to be horizontal and, um, and stable. Uh, make use of traces in, in all these uh, jigging exercises and jig for an appropriate time. Um, a, a similar sort of jig has, was used also on the West Coast, but also for bigger samples. Uh, it's called a pleats jig developed in Namibia um, and also a very effective tool to go for. Shows you some of the concentrates that one can produce from a, a mechanical jig. Um, a, a very good concentrates in, in, in both cases. 
Um, and you probably need to jig this sample. You can see there's still some dark minerals uh, on, on the lighter side. So you scoop out this concentrate, rejig it, and you probably do that for two or three times and make sure that the traces are recovered every time that you that you dig. Then, and later, when, uh, there has been a development in producing uh, micro DMSs, micro dense media separating plants to produce concentrates for small scale samples. Uh, it is, gets more sophisticated. It's obviously can't, you can't take this into the field. You have to set up it in a, in a central treatment station. Uh, it costs more. Um, and it's probably also very good for, for the finer fractions. But it shows you there are different ways of doing it, but it all depends on your budget and, um, and your, um, your logistics. Further concentration and treatment of those concentrates that you have now produced. If you're working in areas where you have uh, lateritic problems or thick uh, soil formations, you may want to treat your samples with, uh, with acid. This is a photograph of the first acid plants that were developed by, um, by among others, Bill McKechnie in the field uh, uh, using oxalic acid that obviously for um, environmental reasons has now moved into the more laboratory environments. Um, but it, it's this, the, this, uh, the, re, the objective is the same, is to clean your samples so that the mineral sorters can pick them out easy. We then move the samples through a heavy liquid um, which separates the, uh, the lighter material still from anything, uh, depending on the liquid that you use, but generally anything uh, heavier than, uh, than three. Um, and and that, then you may still, if you have a lot of magnetite in your samples, for instance, you may still want to put that over a magnetic, se magnetic separator. And the reason for all this is really to provide a concentrate to the mineral sorters who have to pick the minerals out of those concentrates uh, individually uh, to make sure that she has the best opportunity and best chance of picking out these, uh, these concentrates. So you've reduced the, the concentrate, you've cleaned it, and you're presenting the ladies with, uh, with, with a, a good, um, a good pr product. Just remember that you can, go as, uh, you can go finer with your samples. Obviously, as I mentioned, you'll have the chance of getting more indicator minerals, but it also means there are many more grains to look at for these ladies under the microscopes. Um, a, a, a size fraction, so the number of grains per gram, you can see increases enormously if you go to the finer fractions. So that's the payoff. That'll take a lot longer to sort uh, and uh, will add to your budget, both in time and in cost. These are the minerals and, and we've been through it. I'm not gonna go through it uh, in any detail because I think uh, uh, people will talk about it at a later stage, but those are the minerals. They have different colors, which can, for instance, in, in, your, in your garnets, gives you already an idea of what sort of chemistry you're looking at with the, uh, the chrome rich ones generally um, more purple, the aglogetic ones being more orange, um, and then the chrome dioxides, the kimberlitic inomalites, and the, uh, the spinels. Those are the, the, the four species that, uh, that is really looked for in, uh, in Southern Africa. In Canada, they use, make a use a lot of uh, using olivines in their, in their uh, samples. Um, but these uh, are generally not very well, uh, they don't survive our, our rigorous uh, weathering uh, profiles here in, uh, in Southern Africa. In addition to, uh, to the amino species, you can then look at the surface textures. And here are some um, uh, uh, experiments that were done by the Russians looking at various mineral species and, and abrading them through a, a tumbler and trying to see how quickly a certain mineral erodes and using that then perhaps as a, as a, a link to how, how much transport a mineral has gone through. Um, just, re just remember that this is uh, uh, in, in Russia, it's a cold climate. It doesn't uh, have the uh, weathering that we have. So that is fine for that sort of environment, but uh, would perhaps be uh, less useful in areas where you have a lot of uh, diagenesis. Okay, so we've now done our, our stream sampling. We're finding uh, on, on the left-hand side a couple of samples. The red samples are positive samples. So we now can do some more detailed sampling um, and, um, and we can start collecting some samples that we can send for mineral chemistry. So um, we've highlighted an area of interest 
and uh, we've got quite a number of samples that we can now send for for mineral for mineral chemistry, uh, and um, and uh, so that is that's very important. Now, are we going to take this thing further? Is the chemistry interesting enough to to take it further, or do we uh, walk away from this? So um, these these uh, uh, th that would be in your follow up stage. It's often useful when you get to that stage, the follow-up stage, to have a look at what is available in terms of air photographs, or are there any features in the area? This is a photograph of a Kimberley called uh, Kimberlite called 18OP, and a photograph taken in, in 1964, where it, it produces a fantastic uh, photo feature. So um, before any follow-up, Go, go and have a look at some air photographs that might be available or take a flip. It may surprise you. Finch had a, a, a very interesting uh, photo feature, so did Arapa, which we'll see tomorrow. And many, many other Kimberlites have, uh, have features where the soil cover isn't all that great. You then may, may want to move on to uh, onto geophysics. You've got an area of interest. Uh, it, uh, it certainly adds, adds to speed, but it also adds to your budget. Um, and you would only fly areas that you have identified as interesting from, from your sampling. So uh, this is just a photograph of the first airborne survey that was done over the Arapas province uh, using a uh, fairly ant antiquated uh, machine, the Catalina from Canada. Um, but as Gavin Shelf showed yesterday, there are lots of other ways of doing it. And it really depends on uh, the size of area you want to cover, uh, what sort of line interval you want to produce, uh, so there are lots of things that you need to consider before you decide what type of airborne geophysics you're going to use. Uh, that's just a, 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 a photograph of a Kimberlite in Australia, and you can see that the background is, is very quiet. It's something that you need to think about. If you're looking for a, a heavy mineral anomaly in the Bernard Einstein's, flying may not be the best way to go because you'll have enormous difficulty of identifying targets. So what is the background geology and what sort of line spacing should I use for this? And this is a fairly small uh, Kimberlite and it was found by 100 meter line spacing. Um, using 250 meter line spacing, what, what people uh, use a lot, may not be the best way to go. You then go to ground magnetics. Um, my rule is um, no drilling before you have done your ground follow-up. And uh, this shows you uh, and this is a, a magnetite unit in Botswana. That's the, that's the um, airborne survey. And this is the ground magnetic survey. And you can see how very much better defined you, you'll see your magnetite layers for, for drilling purposes. So my rule is you don't drill until you've done your ground magnetic survey. Physical properties of, of Kimberlites. We've probably uh, went through that with Gavin yesterday, and I'm, I'm not going to add a lot more. But it's interesting that most that your magnetic susceptibility increases with depth. Uh, so your, um, your, uh, your diatrium and your, your hyperbyssal zones are better defined than your, crater, your craters. And the, this is also seen in your, in your density where your weathered surface or your sediments on top of your kimberlites have a, a lower density than your diatrium and your, your hyperbyssal facies. So think about your erosions in the areas what to apply in terms of magnetics or geophysics. Um, interesting, one, one can use magnetics and gravity over the same targets and start developing some 3D models. But that does require a, a, a full qualified geophysicist to assist them in interpreting that sort of data. EM, also spoken about Gavin, uh, also a very good tool these days to use, particularly in, in Africa where you have a, a weathered uh, top zone in, in your Kimberlites. Uh, very, very uh, effective. And then the last thing in terms of geophysics is, uh, is looking for, um, uh, look at using ground penetrating radar. It's been tried and tested, um, not all the, always all that successful, and it's probably more effective in, in your alluvial prospecting. In terms of drilling, um, again, it's uh, it, it sounds a simple uh, way of, of identifying targets. It generally is. This is one of the first drill rigs that, uh, that we used. It was a percussion drill. Uh, and uh, you have to be very careful how you identify uh, your chips coming out of that. Uh, this was later improved by reverse circulation. So you didn't have contamination of, uh, of different depths going down your hole. 
Um, and um, it's, it's very important to confirm your drill position by ground geophysics. I can't emphasize that enough. I've seen too many holes missing targets and people walking away from, things, from areas which they felt uh, were uh, not prospective because they've missed the target. Uh, an important tool, and certainly in, in Central Africa, is a portable diamond rig. I, I used to be a great fan of percussion rig drilling, but I've changed that completely. Um, using this portable uh, rig, we were able to drill uh, lots of kimberlites. Um, you end up with a good sample. It's relatively easy to operate. It uses uh, no compressors, so like a... a, a um, a percussion rig, um, and therefore a lot less fuel is needed, and it can be can be uh, flown in uh, by helicopter or even carried in in places, uh, and and you get a, 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 a direct sample which you can use for photography and, and all sorts of other uh, lab technology. So to me, that that is really a, a very important one to go to. Okay, so um, the first steps of assessing your kimberlite, the logging, the sampling for. Uh, once you've got your uh, Kimball out, you do your photography, and Johan would have spoken about that uh, in a bit more detail. It, it can tell you already something about the potential of, of this Kimball out. You then take your core and you, uh, you take some, uh, probably about 20 kilograms to get your, your um, indicator minerals from that, from which you can really already get a very good, uh, much better idea on the uh, potential of this Kimbler, would it carry diamonds or not? And I think Herman will talk a lot about that uh, in the next uh, couple of hours. Um, you can probably get uh, some enough material to do your first micro diamond sample, and, and Hilda will discuss this. Uh, in some detail, but that, uh, in addition to your mineral chemistry, will give you a very good feel for is this kimberlite interesting or is it not? And then using your geophysics, you add your size to it. So there you have, uh, uh, for relatively low cost, come to a point where you now have to decide, well, what am I going to, do I need to do more drilling to confirm the size? to do overburden thickness, to do some density tests, and more importantly, to map the kimberlite. Because each kimberlite will have different, uh, different facies, and, and, and that was discussed to, some, to, to quite a lot of degree yesterday. You need to know when you take your bulk samples, what uh, facies are you sampling? So that then takes you to your evaluation stage. Do I bulk sample or do I walk away? Uh, and, and based on, on once you've done all this work and you've recorded it properly as per the SAM, SAMRAC code and you've um, done your uh, sampling properly, you've done your laboratory uh, techniques, you are in a good position to make a decision uh, and uh, take it to your board and ask either for more money, because bulk sampling will require a lot more money, um, or um, take a risk and, and walk to the next project. Um, quickly talk a bit about the geomorphology. Um, it's, uh, it's very important in your, in your target selection is to assess the terrain, the topography, the soils and the drainage. It really dictates um, your results of your recce sample. And if you don't pick up your first uh, grains in your recce sample, you tend to walk away from this area and may well be walking away from a, a Kimberlite cluster. If you look at a, a geological uh, uh, time frame in terms of uh, aggradation or even a degradation, about 90% of the time nothing really happens. Um, and then you suddenly have a flash flood, you get some sand that comes in and it covers whatever was there before or it cuts, uh, cuts into whatever there was before. But that 90% of the time there is actually a lot going on. This is when soils form. This is when uh, you start weathering, uh, chemically weathering your, your profiles. So your soil form process really depends on your climate. There, there will be lots of organisms um, active in that profile. It depends on your topography, on your water table, depends on your geology, but most importantly, it depends on time. And time, there is enough, millions of years. That, you have uh, that five minutes time left, Mike. Okay. Um, Time is, so, as you mentioned, important. Okay. 
So if we look at Kelpies, uh, they develop certainly in the central part of our uh, southern Africa. That's a photograph of a hard pen felcrete. It's made up of various uh, uh, stages of development. Um, and it's, it's very well described by Frank Mecklenburg. If you're interested, you should read that if you're working in Southern Africa, because it gives you a good insight how calcaries form. But more importantly, it has a very negative effect on your chemolytic minerals. Here are two examples, one by Killam and one by Baumgarter in uh, the Kalahari, where you see your indicator minerals de de decrease from your kimberlite, where there are lots of them, to almost nothing on surface uh, if you have calcretes that have developed over these, uh, over these bodies. So bear that in mind, the effect of calcretes, they trap your minerals, um, they alter the surface features of your minerals, they break them down into very small grains that you normally wouldn't screen for, and they just completely destroy uh, minerals in some cases with, uh, in the low pH environment. The use of termites is therefore used in Botswana to some extent, and uh, I'm not, I'll discuss this a bit more tomorrow, uh, so I'm not going to go into detail, but there are fairly various publications on that. Um, and that leads you to uh, the group twos, uh, which don't produce ilmenites, and there are group ones that also don't produce ilmenites. They occur generally outside of the Kalahari Basin. Um, and so far, there's only one or two kimberlites in the basin that have been found to be group two and ilmenite poor. So it's a problem. And uh, this is an example. That's the uh, um, KX36 found uh, in central Kalahari. There's our results of uh, group ones. But this is a group two, has very few indicators on surface, very difficult to find. Now, quickly diverting to the northern DRC, where you have massive laterit lateritic profiles, and the main indicators in this area was actually diamonds, because the, gra the grains go through a lateritic profile that is very similar to uh, your calcrete profile. It, is it matures and it uh, etches your grains, and this is what non kimberlitic uh, garnets look like. Look at the etching on these grains. You put that through a screen, and it will completely break and destroy these grains. So you end up with nothing. So again, um, something to think about uh, in the future, we'll have to look at uh, looking deeper and looking undercover. Uh, and those are gonna be challenges that for the new generation to think about. Uh, in, in terms of kimberlites, this is an interesting slide where you have years of discovery in, of kimberlites in, in Russia. The first kimberlites were exposed the, the second generation of kimberlites were covered with shallow cover, and uh, the more recent kimberlite discoveries in, the, in, the, in Russia are either covered with sediments or with basalts. And it's a real interesting challenge. So um, geophysics is going to play a major role in your future exploration, and not just geophysics as it is, but the integration of different technologies. So the answer is, um, are we still going to find uh, kimberlites, I believe, yes, there are diamond bearing kimberlites still out there. Um, the, uh, the, the increase in the number of diamond bearing intrusions with increasing age is more a function of burial rather than erosion, so we have to look undercover. Target selection is king. Um, have a look for sedimentary cover areas. Uh, think about that carefully. Um, and also how we take samples. Do we go smaller fractions? Do we have improved DMS recovery processes? And do we have areas with ilmenite poor kimberlites? Uh, and then the emphasis would be on, on, uh, on sensitive uh, geophysical techniques and the integration thereof. But never stop trying. Um, I'm just listing a few people here as my last slide uh, that were instrumental in finding big deposits. The, there is one common trend of these people. They have tenacity and they are optimi they're optimists. And that's what you have to be if you want to become, if you want to get into the exploration side, you have to be both uh, and, uh, and have a drive for it and a love for it. Thank you. Any questions for Dr. Mike? Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask, I believe you said in the 90s, a large number of uh, diamondiferous kimberlites were found. Uh, if you look at the huge increase in diamonds discovered, I know normally there's a, a decrease in the price after that. Why do you think there was a boom in the early uh, 2000s price-wise after that? Uh, 
Sorry, why, why was there a boom after the 1990s, after the discoveries of all these Kimberlites? Yes. Well, I think there were obviously uh, a lot of companies that, that were mining chem uh, diamonds at the time uh, were involved in very aggressive uh, marketing uh, programs, uh, to, uh, and, and which were very successful, actually, uh, to able to market all these diamonds that are coming onto the market. Uh, and that's still uh, something that's, uh, I guess, going on at the moment. I remember being in the beers that our, um, our marketing budget was much bigger than our exploration budget. Um, so people have really been try uh, very successful in, in marketing diamonds um, as a commodity for, um, for love and for eternity, etc. Thank you very much. John, you may have, want to comment on that? No, no, you're absolutely right, Mike. I mean, my question was going to be, um, you know, we, where, 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 where do we have good um, skills and teachers in, you know, the whole thing that you've just mentioned of geomorphology, um, weathering profiles, you know, formation of calcretes, um, you know, there's a, there's a whole field out there. I mean, we, and we have some experts like Greg Water, but strikes me as it's, you know, it's one of these, you um, very broad but very important spheres of geology that we we don't do enough work on. Yeah, I think so, John. I mean, we had uh, we had Tim Partridge and Rodney Maud and, and those people driving uh, geomorphology as uh, as an important aspect. And geomorphology has moved on. It's become quite scientific these days in terms of uh, appetite fish and track dating and cosmogenic dating and what have you. Um, but it's still a very important part in exploration and not just for diamonds, but for, uh, for all sorts of other commodities in, in understanding uh, your, uh, your, your media that you're sampling, your geochemical sampling, what does it mean and how does it affect your results? And I, I, I can't think of where that's really been taught these days, but uh, a lot of it is sitting in, in uh, individual consultants that uh, one has the props at times call on to uh, to explain some of these uh, processes. Yeah. You know, Mike, uh, you know, is there a book or a, some kind of course that people can actually you know, go out there in the field and show young budding exploration geologists how, just how to decide? Like you said, you gave some good examples of how to sample, where to sample. But that knowledge needs to be passed on. It needs to be decided. Is there somebody that can come from afar and actually show? Because you say once you, you pick one method, then you will stick to it. Yeah. And yeah, how do you make sure you sort of end up with a correct method of sampling? And how do you check these guys that are lazy, for instance? Do you have checks and balances back in the laboratory that shows that the guy's not just sitting under a tree and sampling around that type of stuff and then faking? Making the results, you know, to get to get the results back into there, and the experienced guy to come and tell him how to do it. I think, uh, Andy, it's, it's, uh, we were lucky to be in a, at the at the University of the Beers at the time. We had uh, people like Alex Vazel, um, and it was trial and error. I mean, Gavin Lamont in Botswana, and I'll talk a bit about that tomorrow. He he this this discovered that uh, concentrating samples was better doing it uh, with screen samples than using a gold pan, and that took years actually for him to figure this out. Um, and also the scoop sampling method was done uh, developed actually in Zambia by Anglo while they were sampling for um, uh, for for base metals. Um, all these a lot of these uh, uh, techniques was by trial and error. People were experimenting and, and, and looking what was better than other methods. And uh, it's, it's you, you can't, I don't think you can write a book about it. Well, you could write several books. Book, book, yeah. But every, every area is different. Every area has a different drainage pattern, has a different soil development. And you really have to use your uh, experience and your uh, best knowledge that you have to decide what your interval is going to be and 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 do some test sampling that's very important orientation sampling is very important to drag to give you the confidence that you do taking the right uh, decisions of uh, how, how to take a sample yeah my Juan uh, Duplessis wants to know says excellent talk how useful is manganese as an indicator for alluvial de diamond deposits 
Uh, says he knows it's associated with diamonds in the Northwest province, but how does it correlate to other alluvial deposits like you found in the Southern DRC? I think uh, it's interesting that a lot of the alluvials in the Northwest have associated uh, manganese, particularly as uh, little nodules and concretions and whatever. Uh, but there, there's, no, there's no relationship, unfortunately. I mean, the manganese relates to the Dolomites uh, under which they, uh, over which they form. And in some areas, there are diamonds with it and, and other areas they're not. So I don't think there is any relationship that one can use to uh, say, well, there's, there are manganese here, so there are going to be diamonds here. And I don't think that's going to be uh, going to be possible. I don't think there's a relationship, unfortunately. Okay. And secondly, what's to know if a deep erosional pothole found in a stream with a solid rock bottom mass could it also act as a type of trap for diamond concentration? Yeah, it's an interesting point, actually, because um, you'll see that people like uh, jo Jürgen Jacobs done some work on the potholes on the lower orange. And in some potholes, you, you will get no diamonds at all or no indicators at all. It's just been flushed out and, and filled with sand. And you may have to look just beyond the, uh, the potholes. But in general, uh, one would look at potholes, certainly uh, for, for, trap, for the trap of heavy minerals, but it's not always as straightforward as it seems. Yeah. And maybe okay, just, the, just the last Sorry. comment there, there for Mike. I mean, Mike, you, you've been very good at it and maybe it was, or I think it was something that we in De Beers back then were a bit remiss about is using, you know, local expertise. For example, if you went to Brazil or Canada in a glacial terrain, you know, you really also need to go and look, you know, go and talk to the people who know you know, in the case of Canada, obviously glaciology, and in the case of Brazil, it would have been that you know those deep weathering profiles again. Yeah, yeah, there are good people out here. So as I mentioned, Frank Netterberg has done a lot of work on calcretes, yeah. and uh, John John de Villiers uh, in Natal that was great on soils. But there are, there, are, there are new people on the block that, uh, and you need to talk to those people. You need to understand these processes are very important. And those people have a wealth of information and they're generally quite happy to share that. Yeah, yeah and then Yamkela Makupula says, Mike, where do you get all of those books that you showed us at the beginning? Uh, you get, well, a lot of them I got through Amazon, um, but the book on, on diamond prospecting by the beers is unfortunately now um, out of print. And uh, um, we're trying to convince uh, the GSSA that we need some money to Put a second edition out because there's been a lot of interest in it uh, and it's it's just a very interesting book how people uh, went about in the fields taking decisions how to live how to draw their maps um, and how to take your samples what how and it's, it's a very interesting book to read from that point of view so hopefully we'll get uh, some funding to uh, perhaps do a second run but, but Thank just you to very, answer, very much, Mike. Yeah, to answer Yam Keller, sorry, um, Henny, I mean, at the end of the course, we can also put together a list of references. I mean, we have sent some papers to the students, but it's a good point. We'll put together a, a list and, you know, some suggestions of where, where, where you can possibly find those books as well, particularly the ones that are, you know, older. Yeah, 